Thanks, Steve, um, and thanks, Stacy, also for organizing. I have, I'm in the ignominious position of having to um, be the, the cleanup hitter here and follow the great presentations of my colleagues, but the benefit of that is they've done most of the heavy lifting, and so I can just talk to you about some um, sort of, uh, well, I'm going to talk to you about some myths and uh, hopefully dissuade you of those myths over the course of the next 20 minutes or so. Um, so as the previous speakers have indicated, it's in, you know pretty we have an energy system that's very much in transition, which makes it an exciting time to be uh, an energy market observer, um, which I consider myself uh, to be uh, such an observer. But I think it also makes a very scary time to be uh, an energy market uh, 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 participant. Um, but it also means the, the speed with which markets are changing, the technologies are changing, means there are opportunities for firms and for, for entrepreneurs. Um, but it also means there are challenges for policy, which tends to be fairly brittle and slow to adapt um, when what we really need is a, a, policy, that's more a policy that's more nimble. Um, it's also a very noisy environment uh, today, by which I mean on any given day you can see headlines in the media that both predict um, you know, sort of the end of hydrocarbons and, and the uh, survivability of renewables. They predict peak uh, oil or that peak oil is uh, decades down the road. And so it's very difficult to sort of discern where this, where this market is headed. And that's why I've styled this talk today um, as sort of a Mythbusters edition of the economics of 21st century energy systems. Basically, I'm going to discuss some topics uh, that I, that I uh, cover in my own research and then in, my, in the energy economics courses that I teach. So I, I consider there to be sort of four different types of pivot points or, or battles um, raging in the, um, in the uh, transitioning energy economy. The first is between hydrocarbons and renewables. Um, of course, we've had renewable policy since the 1970s, um, motivated in principle by the oil Arab embargo, uh, and sort of the first predictions at that time that uh, our reliance on fossil fuels was going to begin to wane. And if you recall just seven or eight years ago, uh, gas prices in California, where I was living at the time, uh, gasoline prices were at $5 a gallon. No one would have predicted at that time that we'd be seeing gasoline prices nearly, at nearly $2 a gallon. Um, you know, so even though the cost of renewable technologies have declined precipitously in the seven or eight years, um, hydrocarbons or fossil fuels are, are continuing to battle for uh, market share in the energy industry. Um, and there's also sort of this new emerging battle between the US and what we think of as the traditional energy superpowers like Saudi Arabia and Russia, um, uh, propelled primarily by um, shale technologies and the fracking boom. Then there's this sort of much watch battle between distributed generation and traditional utilities. Um, I'll, I'll speak in a few moments more about, about this, but um, sort of the conventional wisdom among regulators is that we need to transition to a system of distributed generation rather than the utility scale or central plant um, system as uh, Dolly was talking about earlier. And yet there's very little economics to support that widespread conventional wisdom. Um, and then finally, I say that there's this, this fight between regulation and investment. Um, Jonas talked a lot about some of the environmental regulation um, that is uh, you know, proposes to help um, clean our air and protect us from climate change. These are all noble goals. But as, the, as uh, policymakers be, inter, intervene more and more into the energy economy, they create more and more uncertainty. And that uncertainty is an enemy toward, to investment. Um, if I'm a firm and I'm confronted with all this uh, uncertainty, Jonas mentioned there were a number of different um, risk mitigation strategies. One of them is to sit on the sidelines and do nothing. And if you consider that, that energy is a ubiquitous input into production in our economy, right? many other sectors of the economy rely on energy inputs, if there's such considerable uncertainty in the energy sector, that uncertainty propagates through the rest of the economy, which means that there's a lot of investment that's sitting on the sidelines. Coming out of a, uh, the Great Recession, we want to see more spending and more capital investment. So the extent that policy uncertainty is uh, causing investors to sit on the sidelines, this is something that we would hope to, to change. OK, so the first myth that I want to bust is that renewables have reached grid parity. And so I'm just giving one example here um, from uh, a little bit less than a year ago from Bloomberg, where the headline reads that solar has already reached grid parity in 10 states that are responsible for 90% of US solar electricity production. Um, now, it's true that the cost of solar and wind have declined dramatically in recent years. 
prompting many to make these types of claims. But these calculations oftentimes are going to incorporate into the cost of solar the subsidies um, that renewable generation receives. And they also don't account for the differences in the types of generating capacity and the types of generation. So here's um, a figure from the EIA. This is our most recent estimate of the levelized costs of electricity generation. And we see that onshore wind in particular um, is cheaper than coal if we're just comparing um, the dollars uh, of the generating capacity. Solar is a little bit more costly. I think this probably doesn't incorporate, um, this figure doesn't incorporate the subsidies that solar would receive. Um, but this figure is misleading because, as I suggested, not all electricity generating capacity is the same. And in, as, as Dahlia alluded, to, well, as Do not alluded to, she mentioned in some detail and quite confidently, so I'm not going to belabor this point, this generating capacity um, is going to vary according to whether it's dispatchable or intermittent. Um, coal and natural gas are dispatchable. The renewables are intermittent. How scalable is the, is the technology? Um, hydro is a fairly cheap renewable type of technology, but it's not very scalable, right? We'd have to build more dams um, and so forth in order to scale up hydropower. Where is the generating capacity located, and what are the costs of, uh, of that generating capacity? And then the generation itself, that is the actual electricity, varies according to the time and location that it's produced. And so we start to account for some of these differences in the generating capacity. It becomes clear that um, renewables aren't yet at grid parity. So this figure is going to account for, this figure is um, using some of my own back of the envelope calculations to include the cost of carbon emissions associated with natural gas and coal, right? So those are costs that are not accounted for in our traditional levelized cost of electricity calculation. So let's add in the cost of the, of the CO2 emissions in terms of um, uh, the social cost of carbon. And let's also add in some, the cost of the health damages imposed by the criteria air pollutants um, from these generating sources. All right, so those, those weigh on the balance of these um, fossil sources. But then we have to account for the intermittency of, of the wind and the solar, because these are not dispatchable technologies. It's really hard to come up with estimates of the cost of that intermittency. But basically, this means we either need batteries or we need backup generation that is dispatchable that's paired with these renewable generating sources. If we account, you know, just this is, again, just one ballpark estimate out of the UK of the cost of intermittency. Suddenly, these generating resources, these renewable resources, um, do not seem as good of a deal as the headlines would have would lead you to believe. And as Dahlia also suggested earlier, as the penetration of these renewables increases, the cost of integrating them into the system is also likely to increase. So this figure is showing um, the net generating capacity. It's a it's a model out of California showing the net. Uh, load on the system in California, net of the renewable generation over the course of a day. And what we see is that the, the net generation, so that is the generation that's required net of renewables, so by the dispatchable generators, is quite low um, during the early to mid-afternoon. But the peak demand occurs later in the day when the sun starts to set. And so the renewables start providing less generation, which requires the, the dispatchable generators to begin to ramp up and produce more electricity. This is called the ramping cost. And as, as the renewable uh, penetration rate increases, this um, sort of the, the belly, if you will, of this duck gets steeper, requiring even more ramping by the dispatchable generation, which is so costly. And so as the penetration of renewables increases, we'd expect the cost of integrating them, that is the cost of their intermittency, to actually go up. So it's also the case that renewables ben benefit from considerable government policy, and for good reason, again, because they're clean technologies relative to the fossil technologies. They benefit from renewable portfolio standards, as Jonas was talking about. They benefit from a 30% federal investment tax credit, um, state, uh, state level incentives and rebates, um, and net metering. And net metering I want to talk about in particular because net metering essentially allows the rooftop um, solar generator to receive a price for the generation that they export to the grid equal to the rate that they pay. So the, rate that, the retail rate that you pay for um, electricity that you consume from the grid is also paid to a rooftop generator for the electricity they export to the grid. But what's true of that rate? It doesn't just account for the marginal cost of the electricity that's being consumed or supplied. right? That retail rate that you pay also incorporates the uh, cost recovery for the fixed cost of the system, for the, for the transmission and distribution system. 
Well, so if you get to export at a rate that incorporates those costs, essentially you, the solar generator, are being paid for providing a transmission and distribution system. But of course, you're not doing that, right? The utility is providing that system. You're benefiting from it. And so net metering is a policy that essentially allows um, the rooftop generator to um, use the grid as a virtual battery, exporting energy from the grid um, when they're not consuming it at their house, and then drawing it from the grid when they are consuming and their solar system isn't producing. And rather than having to pay for this service, this virtual battery, the household's getting paid for it. This is a policy that's not sustainable, in particular because it tends to benefit higher income households who tend to adopt rooftop solar um, in greater, at greater rates than low income households. And so already across the country, we see uh, utilities fighting against this type of a policy. So policy also favors distributed generation over central plant or utility scale generation. The policy favors the rooftop solar panels versus the large scale solar farm. And as I suggested, this is the sort of universal um, opinion of regulators across the country, in spite of any real um, economic analysis that, that suggests this is the direction um, we should be going with the, with the uh, system. So the rooftop system or the distributed generation system economizes on transmission um, costs, right? We can avoid the big transmission systems that bring the power in from the central plant to the city centers, right? Because now the power is being produced in the city center on rooftops, for instance. And we also avoid the line losses that it, uh, occur as the power travels over those high transmission lines. But there's um, research ongoing at Berkeley that suggests there are actually non-trivial uh, power losses as the power leaves the home system and then uh, uh, is transported onto the grid. There are line losses there as well. And these might actually uh, balance out the savings or the avoided line losses that we get from having the distributed system. And then an another important point is that the rooftop um, systems typically aren't sited optimally. Um, a household really only has one choice over where it's going to site its solar, whereas investors in utility scale or central plant solar farms get to optimize according to a number of criteria. Right? So my, some of my research suggests that the public cost per additional watt of rooftop solar is actually, of a rooftop solar subsidy, is actually greater than if the uh, taxpayers just invested in these utility scale systems. So, in Calif so California provides a subsidy to homeowners who adopt rooftop solar. And the idea is to induce more households to adopt solar. But the cost of that program is greater than the cost would be to California taxpayers if they just invested directly in the utility scale project. Why? Because they're subsidizing what we call a lot of what we call free riders. So those households that would adopt the solar anyways, regardless of the subsidy. Um, and there's a cost associated with the uh, suboptimal siting of the solar. So here's a map of California. This shows the solar irradiance in California with darker shades of red, indicating areas with greater solar, um, solar energy generating potential. Um, as you, this is San Francisco, um, San Diego, Los Angeles, Santa Barbara around here. Um, if you've ever been to San Francisco, you know that it's oftentimes foggy. Um, a quote attributed to Mark Twain is that the coldest summer I ever spent uh, sorry, the coldest winter I ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. So this is probably not where you want to be installing the solar in California. But look where the solar tends to congregate, right? Right in San Francisco. And if you also know San Francisco and California, that's not surprising that the solar is being adopted along the coasts, OK? But so this is suboptimal siting. And so I conducted a you know, simple thought experiment. What if we took all of the solar capacity and sited it optimally, that is, in the sunniest, on the sunniest rooftops? And because we're concerned that if there's more than 15% renewable, re renewable generation capacity in any particular area that the grid might not be stable, let's limit the amount of solar in any zip code to only 15% of the rooftops. So that's a thought experiment I undertook. And here's where you would optimally site the solar. Okay, So this was the figure I showed you on the previous slide repeated again. Um, th the black dots there are the black dots here. These blue dots reflect where we would optimally site the solar. Okay, so I expected there, there would not be perfect overlap. But what really surprised me is how little overlap there is. Right? So all of this solar that's adopted here in the sort of greater Los Angeles area um, would, more, would be more suitable on rooftops a little bit farther out. Th that is, more in the desert areas of California. Okay. Myth three, 
Um, natural gas is a cleaner transportation fuel than gasoline or diesel. Um, so quoting here, um, MIT's Chris Knittel, an envir uh, environmental and energy economist, he wrote um, in 2012 that because natural gas is cleaner in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and local pollutants compared to both coal and oil, replacing these other fossil fuels with natural gas can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and health problems associated with local pollution. Okay. President Obama has made similar claims, as have um, Senators uh, Carl Levin and James Inhofe. Um, who proposed legislation to subsidize a transition to natural gas transportation fuels. And in part, they're right. So now I'm showing carbon intensities of, all, of various transportation fuels. And we can see the natural gas fuels, the compressed natural gas and the liquefied natural gas here. And they look, you know, here's gasoline, right? So they, they fare favorably to gasoline. I guess I don't have diesel on this, uh, in this figure. Um, and they look cleaner even than some of these biofuels. Well, the red part of the biofuels reflects um, the, car the carbon emission, life cycle carbon emissions, and in particular, the carbon emissions associated with indirect land use change. Right? And this has been, um, the indirect land use change has been a highly controversial part of biofuels. But the, I, the notion here is um, if I'm growing energy crop on land that's displacing food crops, that food crop might move to some new natural habitat land, which is now no longer sequestering carbon. Right? So it's going to emit carbon as that land is brought into production. And so you know, perhaps rightly, arguably, biofuels sort of incur this penalty associated with the indirect land use change emissions. Um, that's the red shaded region there. But what most of the, most of the policy has ignored is the fact that there's, there are indirect emissions associated with natural gas use and transportation as well. Okay, what are those indirect emissions? Well, what is the if natural gas isn't used in the transportation sector, where is natural gas used predominantly? Electricity, electricity generation. If electricity, generator, if electricity isn't being generated from natural gas, what's the closest substitute to natural gas? Coal. coal. So now we're shifting from, from electricity generated from natural gas to coal, at least on the margins. right? So each incremental unit of natural gas we use in transportation is, is either a unit of natural gas, that, an additional unit of natural gas that has to be produced supplied, or one less unit that's used elsewhere in the economy. right? And so natural gas-fired uh, electricity generation is about half as dirty as carbon-fired uh, electricity generation. So as, we sh so as the increasing reliance on natural gas and transportation shifts our reliance, um, uh, shifts electricity generation towards coal, it's going to have um, an emission that's going to cause emissions. Okay, so this figure is just showing, this is what we call a dispatch curve, it's just showing how as we increase gener cumulative generation, um, you know, think of this as a supply curve. So we have dollars measured on the uh, vertical axis, and we're increasing generation on the horizontal axis. And this is just showing which units are brought online to meet the generation um, as the cumulative generation increases. And the point here for our purposes is just that these yellow dots represent natural gas plants. The uh, brown squares represent coal plants. And what we see is that over this entire range, they're substituting. Right? There's essentially a coal plant that's right on the margin with a natural gas plant. So they're substituting over this entire range. We can see this differently in this figure, which just shows the, the shares of electricity generation uh, from coal and natural gas. And the fact that they're so strongly negatively correlated suggests that they're substitutes. Okay? So if we account for the fact that um, natural gas used in transportation is going to displace natural gas use in electricity and shift electricity generation towards coal, we can calculate the indirect coal use change emissions from natural gas fuels. And so that's what I've done here. And each of these, this blue, purple, and, and sort of lighter purple color show different estimates of this, these indirect emissions associated with natural gas use in transportation. Um, this indirect coal use change effect. And you can see that even with the smallest of our estimates of this indirect emissions, suddenly the LNG is dirtier than the diesel, and the CNG um, is nearly as dirty as the gasoline. Okay. Relatedly, myth four is that electric cars are cleaner than hybrids or conventional cars on the road. This is also a myth um, for sort of a similar reason. So obviously, there are no tailpipe emissions associated with, with uh, vehicle miles traveled in an electric car. But this electricity has to come from somewhere. As, as, as probably obvious now, this electricity is going to come from power plants that are going to be polluting. And so each electric vehicle that we plug into the system is going to require some marginal 
um, a, some marginal increase in electricity generation. And those marginal emission rates are going to vary across the country and across time. So depending on when you're charging your car and where you're charging your car, the emissions, asso the emissions associated with that incremental um, electricity supply is going to vary. And a result that other economists have, have provided us is that if a plug-in um, electric vehicle um, is plugged in in the Midwest and recharged overnight as is recommended, it's going to generate more emissions per mile than not even a hybrid car, but it's going to it's gonna, uh, generate more emissions per mile than the average car currently on the road. Okay, so a the good news is a, plug -in, a PEV in California is going to be cleaner than a hybrid vehicle. Okay? Myth five, the Keystone XL pipeline is a jobs project. Okay, so I'm quoting, this is a little bit unfair, I'm quoting um, Mary Landrieu when she was in that election battle um, um, last year, um, and Keystone XL was sort of a, a, um, critical in her election, but she says that it's going to generate millions of, of permanent jobs. Okay, well this is a myth. Why? Because the Keystone XL is a 1,700 mile pipeline that would pr propose to bring um, t tar sands crude from Alberta, Canada down to Cushing, Oklahoma, and then eventually um, connect it to um, uh, uh, Gulf refining and exports in Texas. And you know, seemingly we, we could imagine that increasing electricity, or so sorry, crude oil supply in the US is going to lower energy prices in the US and have all these um, correlative benefits. But the, the problem is that um, almost every industry or every sector of the economy is not actually consuming crude oil. It's consuming some refined oil product. And these refined oil products, the price of these refined oil products are set in a world market, which Keystone XL is not going to affect. So Keystone XL might affect crude prices in the US, but no one in the US is consuming crude except for the refineries, which are then refining the products and then sending, selling them on this world market. But so Keystone's not going to change the world prices for these refined products, which isn't going to then lo thereby lower the input costs for any industry in the US. So it's hard to imagine a world in which this creates any substantial jobs at all. Okay, and yet here we have a Democrat senator battling for election, propagating this myth that, it's a, that the Keystone is a jobs program. Likewise, though, um, Keystone also isn't likely, you know, if we block Keystone, we're also not likely to keep the tar sands in the ground, right? Because there are other ways for um, uh, Canadian tar sands producers to get that crude to market, either other, you know, primarily going either east or west within Canada, right? Okay. Um, I'm just. Uh, on account of time, I might skip a couple of myths here. Um, well, so a lot of people think, so right now Congress is debating um, eliminating an export ban on crude oil that has been in place since, uh, for decades. And they're proposing to eliminate it because the U.S. has become, uh, started rapidly increasing its production of crude oil. Okay? This figure shows the recent uptick in crude oil production. Well, this, this Export ban has, and this married to this dramatic increase in production, has driven a wedge between the domestic price for crude oil, which is this West Texas, Texas intermediate price, and the world price, the world Brent price for crude oil. And so you can see the gap between these lines here um, starting in about 2011 and persisting through most of last year. Um, it narrowed a little bit um, at the start of 2015. Um, this wedge represents the fact that the crude that's being produced in the U.S. is being refined in the U.S. because we can't export it, right? The export ban is precluding the exports. But the refineries are reaching capacity. They can't process any more of this crude. And so it's suppressing prices in the U.S., which is why this blue line is below the red line. If it weren't but for this export ban, these lines would continue to uh, basically coincide. Okay. Well, as I've already argued, even if we allow the export of uh, crude oil, these prices are going to now coincide again. It'll raise the domestic price for crude, but gasoline prices are set on a world market. So if anything, the thought is that eliminating the export ban might actually lower gasoline prices in the US. Why? Because once these, the prices for crude oil are no longer artificially depressed because of this export ban, 
oil producers will ramp up their production at least incrementally. And that incremental production will have a very um, marginal effect, but incremental effect to reduce the world price of gasoline. And then the final, the final myth that I want to talk about, and I'll close on this one, um, is that the, you might have observed in the, in the news over the past year or so this oil by rail phenomenon. Um, we have these huge oil trains that are exploding and, and uh, colliding and so forth and creating a lot, of, um, a lot of risk and fear in communities. And um, as the Wall Street Journal articulated, um, there's an argument that, this, that the reliance on uh, rail to transport all this crude oil is a function of the inability of pipeline operators to get their pipelines approved because environmental groups and NIMBY groups are obstructing them. Right? Now, I think there's certainly some evidence that that's true, but I want to argue that, it, that it, and at least, as an, at least as an important, sorry, a, a, uh, a, a, at least as important a reason for the uh, delay in, in siting pipelines is uncertainty. Okay, so uncertainty plays an important role here. A pipeline is sort of the quintessential fixed um, sunk investment, right? Once you, you know, the pipeline can only carry a certain type of commodity, and it only goes from one point to another. You can't pick up and move the pipeline. So if there's some uncertainty about where you're going to want to ship your product or how much product you're going to want to ship, you're not going to want to build a pipeline. Crude by rail has the advantage that the tracks are already laid. You can add another car to the, to the train if, if you want to move a little bit more crude, um, and so on. So you don't need to make this fixed, in, this fixed investment. With the ex crude export ban in place, refineries in California are finding it cheaper to procure their crude from domestic producers, like the Bakken, uh, I guess not the Bakken, well, yeah, the Bakken in North Dakota, um, some parts of uh, uh, Texas and Wyoming and Montana and so forth. They're accustomed, they have traditionally gotten their crude oil from overseas, from Asian producers. And so it arrived by ship. Well, now they need to get it over land from the Midwest to their refineries uh, on the coast. And there isn't a pipeline. So why aren't they building a pipeline? Well, if there's some probability that this export ban is going to be lifted, as seems likely, then suddenly they're not going to want to source their crude in the Midwest anymore. They're going to want to revert to getting their crude from overseas and having it arrive by ship. They wouldn't need a pipeline if the export ban is lifted. And so because of this policy uncertainty, they're not, building, they're not building pipelines. And so Jonas suggested that there was some uncertainty about environmental regulation. I want to say there's uncertainty beyond environmental regulation. Yes, there's uncertainty about whether the Clean Power Plan will withstand Supreme Court scrutiny. But there's also considerable uh, energy policy that introduces uncertainty um, that then leaves a lot of investment stranded on the sidelines. Um, and I'll stop there. <laughs>